everyone. Welcome to the solar webinar series. Um, we are the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and this webinar is one of our initiatives. We aim to make a range of topics publicly available to a wider audience, and uh, we do so by inviting researchers to share some of their work. Um, and we hope to create a repository of videos of uh, exciting topics in the learning analytics community. Uh, and therefore, we will also post a recording of today's talk to our YouTube channel so you can watch at a later time. And uh, we will be your host for today, uh, myself, Isabel, and, and Pita as well. He's also um, involved in the organization in the background. And we're very happy that you're all here and uh, in different time zones of the world. So for me, it's quite late, but for some people, it's very early. So um, very happy that you could all join us. Uh, let me first introduce a little bit about the communication rules that we have in the webinar. Uh, if you've joined us before in one of the webinars, you will know that we previously used a different Zoom format where we had the Q&A box, but we are now in a more regular Zoom meeting environment. So we don't have the Q&A box, but if you have questions for Sandra during her talk, please post them in the chat. And we, uh, Isabel and I will collect them and we will save them for after her talk and ask them. So if you do have questions during the talk, feel free to post them and we will keep track of them. Uh, and um, yeah, if at the end you have questions, you can also raise your hand and we will give you the microphone to ask them live. So that's for how we will organize the webinar. Uh, first, uh, please let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, we're very excited that Professor Sandra Milligan joins us today. Uh, Sandra is the director of the Assessment Research Center at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne. And her research, as, as her um, university uh, name suggests, focuses on assessments. And in particular, if I may say so, uh, Sandra, on aspects of learning that are hard to assess. So the very difficult things to assess. And that ties in neatly with the, with the field of learning analytics, since um, I think we all somehow have as our goal that we can use this data that we derive from digital learning platforms to create opportunities for assessment of difficult things uh, concerning learning. So it's, it's a tough question of how can we do that? And uh, we're very happy that today Sandra can hopefully shed some light on this question. So thank you very much for being here, Sandra, and the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Inuska. Um, Yes, learning analytics is absolutely fascinating. And for people like me, um, it, uh, well, I used to think it was the great white hope and I'm still very optimistic, but uh, today in my talk, I'm gonna be fairly measured about um, the opportunities for learning analytics. And I hope that we'll have a great discussion afterwards. Um, before I start, let, let me, um, give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from. Because if you know where someone's coming from, you can uh, judge uh, what they're saying. I'm um, what they call an enterprise professor at the University of Melbourne. I run the Assessment Research Centre, which is 25 people who, who um, for the last, um, been fairly stable for the last 25 years. And we um, research assessment, credentialing recognition of learning. By enterprise, that means that we have to learn our, earn our own living. The university, we're not standard academics. When we don't have tenure, we're on soft money only, and that's the money that we generate from our own research. That makes us pretty attuned to the um, assessment industry and the assessment marketplace. And a lot of my comments today will be um, coming from the point of view of what's practical, what's exciting, what's cutting edge as distinct from what's possible. Um, so there's, a, there's an important distinction there. Um, I, I guess um, in terms of learning analytics, the University of Melbourne was uh, an early kid on the block with that. 
I was really lucky to be able to cut my learning analytics teeth using MOOC data. Um, Melbourne University was the first Australian university to get into MOOCs. So we had all this data all over the place um, that we were able to play with, interrogate, um, and the use of log stream data for assessment was something that we really went into. Um, Sandra, just a, sorry, you're not sharing screen, just to remind you, you're not sharing screen at the moment. Yeah, that's, a, that's okay. okay. I'll, I'll, okay. <laughs> thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll pick that up later. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, so the MOOC data was really important for us to cut our teeth on what learning analytics might mean for assessment, particularly process data, all the log stream data, things like that. In addition, the university was the first university in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose many of you are in the Northern Hemisphere, so it won't count for you, but we were the first to use um, a blockchain for the issuing of credentials and all of the implications of that. Um, in addition, the Assessment Research Centre has been really um, leading the way in some respects for developing digital tasks to assess things like collaborative problem solving. And in fact, I think our work prefigured um, un under the leadership of Professor Patrick Griffin, who was uh, my predecessor, prefigured the work that the OECD did on assessment of collaborative problem solving using um, com agents um, to collaborate with people who were taking the tests to test their, their capacity to collaborate. So we've been in this game for a long time by learning analytics standards. Um, but the key thing is that not much of that um, cutting edge research work that we've done has actually translated itself into practical things that have been taken up by the industry. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that today because I think we've got a challenge there in learning analytics um, as to why that's so. Now, um, I'm now going to see if I can share my screen, Vito. So let's see how we go here. Um, all right. Right, um, you'll let me know if this doesn't work, okay? Um, so did that advance? Okay, all right. So um, this, this screen, this, this slide um, is a bit messy, but it's trying to capture all the areas that we've noticed in the Assessment Research Centre where learning analytics or at least digital capacity is impacting on assessment. And I just want to make a few comments about this. Um, in, up here, um, where there's been a lot of really interesting work um, on how to ensure integrity in assessment and how to monitor performance, basically looking for cheating and so forth. Um, and we were involved in some of the stylometry work, which I think is has been really interesting in, in identifying who's actually writing essays, for instance, in assessment. Um, and that, that has been, I think, very cutting edge work and all the work on identity checkers. However, having said that, we don't call that assessment analytics or learning analytics, we call that policing analytics. So um, it's really good work, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, another area that's been really uh, the focus of a lot of work is in item and, and task development. Um, just to give you an idea of how uh, important this is, uh, if you are developing an item for, say, a standardised um, high stakes testing program, 
um, the going rate in the community is between one and two thousand dollars per item to develop that. And if you're de uh, developing digital tasks, they are hugely expensive. So many people in the assessment industry have sought to find ways to quickly and cheaply develop high quality items and tasks. Um, and I, I I mean, someone in the audience here might be able to argue with me, but our general feeling is that to develop the quality that's required, you still, the automation um, and the use of analytics or digital means to develop those things hasn't really delivered. And so most of the work is still done by hand, really. They're crafted items. So th that hasn't been something that we've been able to pursue very strongly. Um, automated scoring with test analysis and multiple choice and short answer, same old, same old. Basically, we've been doing the same thing for the last 30 or 40 years. Things get faster, quicker, more accessible. But in terms of the research and the capacity building that we've got, I'm not, not seeing learning analytics making a huge impact in that area. Um, administrative efficiency is a huge one, but again, it's administrative, not learning analytics. Um, uh, particularly the one that I'm, I really love is the great, greater capacity now to have peer assessment as an individual, as a routine part of a learning environment. Um, usually to set up peer assessment, it's, you know, by hand, it's hugely administratively um, big overhead. Um, but now with the apps and tools and so forth, it's quite smooth. And the LMS systems are building in lots of administrative tools that make assessment much smoother. Um, similarly, with adaptive testing, um, the adaptive testing technology and understanding hasn't really changed for 30 or 40 years but the digital um, capacity makes it much easier for people to use, so that's good. Um, what you won't notice in that, um, in that schedule there is much to do with machine learning. When it comes to assessment, which needs to be considered, um, you, can't, you can't let machines learn things um, and maybe take us off track. So I'm not entirely sure that I've seen anything that's got machine learning in it that we would trust for high stakes testing. Um, you get into the Facebook problem. So there's not much in machine learning. Again, I'd love to be contradicted um, by people in the audience later on, but that's not something in the Assessment Research Centre we've been able to find marketable, saleable or useful in the industry. Um, so, um, so far what I've said um, goes to the idea that much of the digital capacity and much of the learning analytics that has been done is, um, is I call it administrative support or policing support or improvement um, of efficiency. Um, but the, the real area that we're interested in and that I believe our clients are interested in are these areas um, here. Uh, am I going to advance here? Um, that I've starred. Um, and, and this is the promise of learning analytics, which, you know, 10 or 12 or um, years ago, we thought that what learning analytics would provide for us is much greater capacity to assess different things. So we wanted to be able to change what's assessed. We wanted therefore to change how it's assessed and therefore provide better feedback. And it's those areas that I really wanna focus on today um, to have a look at how we're going and what are the challenges and frontiers that we've still got to, uh, st still got to work at. Um, so what are, what, I wanna now talk a little bit about 
the assessment industry and where it's going and what it's doing and where learning analytics could or should help. And particularly, I want to talk about what's assessed, how it's assessed, and how feedback on learning is provided. Now, the key question to ask is, where do you look to find out where the industry is going? Where do you look? Do you look at what ETS is doing? Do you look at what PISA is doing? Do you look at what governments say they're doing? Um, in our experience over 20 years, they're not really the places to look. The places to look are at in, in, um, on the ground to see what I call first movers are doing. The first movers are those educational institutions that are trying to improve what they do. And you'll usually find that places like, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, big, uh, the big assessment industry players and governments, they're usually about five years behind what the first movers are doing. So in the ARC, we've made an assessment research centre, we've made a habit of um, uh, cultivating research partnerships with first movers who are doing what we think are the really important things that are prefiguring what's going to happen in the assessment industry over the next few years. Um, at the moment, what we uh, the first movers we work with at the moment we're working with about a, we have a hundred research partnerships uh, with schools, with um, uh, corporations and with uh, universities, technical institutions and so forth, who have assessment challenges that they're trying to solve and they've established research partnerships with us. These are the sorts of concerns that our first movers have. Um, they, firstly, they want to define learning success in ways differently to the ways that assessment has defined it in the past. In the past, assessment has mainly looked at cognitive skills, what uh, Lauren Resnick calls unsupported mentation, captured in uh, standardised tests or essays or whatever. They want to um, enable uh, learners, particularly at higher education, but also in schools, to let um, individual passion and interest drive the learning, which means that you can't really have standardised approaches to teaching or learning design or assessment. They want to see um, the assessment schedules in, in national testing or examinations uh, changing so that they're not driven. Assessment is often the, the tail that wags the dog. They want to see that the standardised testing and assessment uh, tail stop wagging their dog and they want to um, change the assessment, uh, the, the, the way we design learning, which includes teaching and assessment. And they want this all scalable and practical. They don't want everything to have to be boutique. If I can just... Um, uh, um, go through some of the things that they're telling us um, in a bit more detail because this is what drives the assessment industry or it should drive it will be driving the assessment industry over the next few years first of all they have different uh, ambitions for learning that is current than is currently captured in the assessment programs of main, most lecturers, most teachers, and most standardised tests. This little diagram shows the kind of things that they actually want to assess, um, rather than the things that, that, that tests do test now. I, and I'd make just a couple of points about this. That area of knowledge and know-how, I would think most lecturers, most teachers think that they're teaching knowledge and know-how. But in fact, um, it, because the assessment is often unfortunately focused on recall 
or what students have been coached on. The, the feeling at the moment is that learners don't have the capacity to have deep mastery of the core processes in disciplines or professions that is really required. So the task, the contemporary ambition is to get every learner to have great depth um, in their learning, not just um, coverage of a particular, um, a particular uh, subject uh, curriculum. Uh, other key areas are learner agency. In the 21st century, it's really important that learners do have the capacity to chart their own learning. So how do you assess that? This is really an important outcome of universities and schools. Uh, connective, connectedness, actually, that is a better word than that. Um, universities are saying, we need to produce fully fledged prof young professionals when they graduate, which means that they need to be connected to their discipline or their profession, to their peers, et cetera. How do we measure that? because this is what employers are wanting. We want to know that and so forth and so on. So these are the kinds of things that people come to us and say, that's what we want to measure. And we're not measuring it now. Um, just in case you don't believe me, I've, I make a collection of all the learning ambitions frameworks that we come across um, during our clients. And, the interesting thing about them is that they're all roundels or most of them are roundels. And I've sort of come to the conclusion that that's because um, educators or teachers recognize that it's the whole person and the development of the whole person you're looking at. And all of these things have connection. You can't have deep learning in a discipline without critical thinking and those other general capabilities. But anyway, this is, um, I've got about 50 of them, uh, learning ambitions that are captured mostly in roundels. And people come to us and they say, this is what we want to assess. Um, and, and we try and help them do that. Um, the interesting thing about all of this, of course, is that multiple choice questions and essays are just not able to do that. It uh, just doesn't work. So that's why they come to us. Um, the second um, area of uh, frontier or that we're asked to do is to provide new kinds of credentials and reports. I mean, most um, educational institutions at the moment provide a score. You're an 80, you're a 20. Um, and whether it's in a subject, um, in Australia, we have the ATAR and we provide everyone at the end of their 12 years of schooling with one number um, to represent their learning in, um, in over 12 years of school. I, I don't know how we get away with it, really. So um, ask any 17-year-old in Australia how they went at school. They'll say something like 72 um, and that's their ATAR score. So what, what our new first movers are saying to us is, oh, forget scores. All they do is rank. They don't tell us anything about what a student knows or can do. Students say, I shouldn't be defined by a number. I want to know, I want to be defined by what I know, what I can do and who I am. So the representation of learning is getting a lot of attention at the moment. This little, um, I call it a chrysanthemum that you can see on your screen is a stylized approach that we're using to representing learning. Um, and there's a couple of points about that that I wanna highlight. Uh, first of all, um, if, if this is a report for a student, you can see that the petals on the chrysanthemum or flower or propeller, boys prefer propeller, girls pr prefer chrysanthemum, um, not always gender-based, but you can see that you can, um, that the, the different domains of learning can each be represented by a petal. The concentric circles represent the standards which the student has attained in those areas in, and in Australia, there are a number of um, 
standards frameworks that can be referenced here. There's the Australian Qualifications Framework, various skills framework, and what students and teachers and employers are saying is we want to know in what areas a student has learned and we want to know the standard they have reached and this sort of representation shows that students themselves say it's more important for me to know how i'm going in mathematics or how are how my critical thinking's coming along um, against the standards than it is to know what's on your st most standard dashboards like how many lectures did i go to well you know children kids know how many lectures they went to what they really want to know is are they acing their learning are they developing the competencies and capacities they need um, to come out of their schooling and this sort of uh, credential and reporting which is standard based standards based developmental holistic is the kind of uh, thing that our first movers are saying they want um, the, the the other another frontier that people are coming to uh, is they really really want to assess complex competencies it's all very well to you know um, say well yes this person is good at abstract mathematics but what about the question of whether they're a good engineer or if they're a school student how good are they at collaborative problem solving or um, are they what how would they rate on a construct like employability that's uh, you know do they do they fit in are they employable what about entrepreneurialism so people are focusing on these complex constructs and they want to be able to assess them. Um, the, the traditional way of doing that is to dip stick into a whole pile of elements of that and then sum them together, add them up. You know, you do an essay, add it to the multiple choice, add it to the portfolio score and come up with something that could well be might be a score on the complex competency. In fact, when you get down to the learning science, you cannot, get, um, the, the, the whole is not the sum of the parts, despite the fact that for hundreds of years, educators have just been saying a score is the sum of all the parts. What complexity in performance is actually a unitary thing that comes from um, the integration of a whole pile of things like attitudes, values, know-how, knowledge. Independently assessing the knowledge and bits of the know-how and the values and adding it together does not give you a sense of the proficiency on these complex constructs. And um, that's one of the big challenges. So I'm going to spend a few minutes just digging into that because I think it's quite core to notions of assessment. Um, now, obviously, if you're assessing someone, you're putting them on a scale. That's it. That's what assessment is. And the scale has to be well defined if it's good assessment. Now, what we find in complex competencies is that scales are not defined quantitatively. They're defined by qualitative shifts in performance of, um, of a learner. Um, they, you know, um, uh, even if you take something, oh gosh, I'm not a sports person, so I'm gonna go out on a limb here. But if you take someone um, who's, who does high jump, um, when you're trying to work out what they do and what constitutes proficiency, you, you, um, their technique and their capacity to perform, now cricket's probably better, but I know lots of people don't like cricket. It's a very complex th thing. You have to be able to throw, you have to be able to catch, you have to be good at teamwork, all of those kinds of things. Um, but it's as you go up 
the levels of proficiency, you find that it's not just that the best players can throw harder, run faster, um, hit the ball further. It's not, they're not quantitative things. It's got to do with how they perform under pressure, how they work together with the team. And the, the qualitative shifts in performance are what you're actually looking for when you're looking for assessment of complex competencies. Um, a, a corollary of that is um, how we set the levels. Um, th this is a bit technical. I hope um, this is okay. This is what's called the right map, which is used in assessment quite a lot. On the left-hand side, the crosses are your histogram of scores for learners. So each X, I think, is 10 people in this class. So you can see the, the, the normal curve and um, uh, there are a few people right at the top. The, the left-hand um, uh, scale is in logits. It's a, a, legit, um, a logarithmic scale. On the right-hand side is all the items that we use, were devised from log, log stream analysis. And what you can see is that if you look right down the bottom, you can see item 10.1 and item 46.1. The vast majority of people got that past that, that item. So that's very, very easy. Up the top, we've got 10.4 and 29. Now only a handful of people actually passed those items. They, they got them right. So this shows the pattern of the ability of the students um, against the patterns of difficulty of the items. Um, I can see a few faces and um, not everyone's looking quizzical. So I'm gonna, I assume that makes sense. And what we've done there is got uh, made bands. So the top band is the high level of proficiency. This is actually a scale of collaborative problem solving. The second band um, is uh, the second level of proficiency and so forth and so on. Now, the important point I wanted to make about this is, and the, the point is that the items at the top, the hard ones are not just quantitatively more difficult than the items below them. And I, this, this is illustrated by this. I, actually, um, yeah. Um, so what we find is the thing that differentiates the really top performers from the bottom performers is, um, uh, is not that they do more of anything, but they do different things. In other words, it's qualitatively different performance, not quantitatively different performance. The ones, uh, the performances at the bottom of this scale are basically defined by um, doing as you're told, um, looking at using the syllabus, not, not moving um, particularly away from it. The people at the top of the scale are defined by their deep engagement with other learners in, in the um, activity. So that the qualitative shifts are the things that define the scale. Um, if, if that makes sense. So this is not an additive process. It's a process of working out the characteristic behaviours that constitute the shift in performance in these complex competencies. Um, just, just to try and summarise, um, uh, one of the things we do in the Assessment Research Centre is we try and make poems about the important points we make. And I've got here a poem. It doesn't rhyme. Um, and if you don't like poems, you can just sort of uh, justify left and it becomes a checklist, right? But um, the point that I'm trying to make in my comments here is that um, where learning analytics can be most helpful is get shifting assessment away from the dominant paradigm that we've got into an emergent paradigm, which is tackling the problems we really want to tackle in the industry. The dominant paradigm is sort of captured by this uh, poem here, 
and it's um, and uh, the dominant paradigm looks at individual mentation or knowledge production. Um, it uses common invigilated standard performance tasks. It tries to strip out anything that might cause bias. In the um, in, in in other words, uh, purpose, personal interest, context, and so forth. Um, usually, it's scored by trying to take out any judgment, any human judgment. Um, human judgment is, for some reason, considered to be flaky. So we try and take that out, and we place people on a numerical scale. The um, the frontier paradigm or the new paradigm is very different and it's saying it's a process of gathering evidence of light of very different types and this is where the log stream and so forth can come in um, during performances that may not be standard and to place people on a scale that shows their position on a scale of competence not just a numerical scale where there's those qualitative shifts and to represent that in a standardized way. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're getting the point here that the kinds of assessment that are now being required in our schools and our universities um, are, is a different kind of beast than it has been over the last uh, 100 or 50 years where assessment uh, conventions were sort of developed. Um, I've put my two poems on one sheet, um, just uh, if, uh, for comparison. So the dominant paradigm and what I call the frontier paradigm are, in some respects, you know, to the uninitiated, it might look much the same, but it's very, very different philosophical underpinnings under the um, under the assessment. Now, um, when Ever I look at an assessment program that's been devised, I do a series in my head of plausibility checks, particularly if they're based on learning analytics, particularly if they're um, claiming to measure complex competencies, and particularly if they're using different kinds of data like log stream data or process data and so forth. So I put this here um, just as a reference to how uh, important it is to have good quality underneath this new kind, these new kinds of assessments. Um, the first thing is obviously is to check uh, and where's the evidence that what's measured is what's intended? Um, so if, um, if an author or a researcher doesn't provide any evidence that the, the measure that they've pasted together actually measures what's intended, that's a validity check, then we have to be a bit sceptical that that, that about what they've actually measured. Deep competence um, is much more difficult to measure, for instance, than recall and memorization. But it's very easy to get sucked into believing that you've measured deep competence when you've actually only measured recall. So um, there, there needs to be always evidence to make sure of that. Um, another um, thing to look at is does a higher score actually mean greater proficiency? And often the answer is no, because uh, a score is made up of many components. One, one is the score on the um, measure that's sought. Another, and there's, but there's always noise. So sometimes you're picking up irrelevant things. For instance, if you're um, assessing problem solving, um, mathematical problem solving, you may actually get a literacy and comprehensive comprehension component in there because people have to be able to understand the um, explanation of the problem. And then there's measurement error, which is always there. So um, quite often a higher score will actually mean lots of error or lots of irrelevant measure. 
So really, there needs to be um, some evidence that the person who's made the assessment is confident that the, a higher score does actually mean um, greater proficiency. Um, another one is uh, learning is represented as a score rather than a subtraction of before and after. Learning is obviously a growth process. Um, and if you just use a single score, I, we found in the MOOCs, for instance, that the people who scored highest were all the lecturers who did it to check what everyone else was doing. So you couldn't actually say that you taught anyone anything because the people already knew it before they came. So it's really important that uh, learning is represented as change. Um, a big one these days is that engagement is used as a proxy for proficiency. It is not. It is not. So it may well be that you think that because everyone, someone did all the um, trivial quizzes and watched all the videos, that they're going to be more proficient than someone who didn't. That's just not true. So um, you, it's, you've got to really argue for, um, for the argument, for the data that you use. Um, is the feedback provided about actual learning? Um, this is where the chrysanthemum idea comes in. Um, a lot of dashboards provide a lot of information, none of it which actually goes to whether a person is improving in proficiency. Um, and I think that's a major problem for analytics. Is more data better? Good question. Are high correlations good? Well, uh, often not. Um, to an assessment person, uh, um, high correlations in the components in, the, in an assessment might just mean a great deal of redundancy and you're not actually getting any further information. Um, another one is, oh, look at my lovely normal distribution. Um, and this is an issue, I guess, with prediction as well. The purpose of teaching is to disrupt the normal distribution and to disrupt prediction. So um, if you're, unless you're shifting everyone up the curve, um, then you're not teaching. So if, if the normal curve starts like that, and then it finishes like that as well with a bit of a shift, you could ask yourself, what are you doing other than allowing people an opportunity to develop as they would otherwise? So um, again, in measurement, we look for more than just a general shift in the normal curve. We look for the fact that um, high ability people were really stretched and lower pe ability people to begin with are brought up um, and the competence comes out for all. Um, how am I going for time? Um, so um, in, in summary, what I'd say is these are the things on this slide that I think are the important, uh, the important frontiers for learning analytics. And that is how to generate and represent warrantable, that is trustable, assessments of complex competencies. And that list there is the sort of thing um, that we're focusing on and trying to solve in the Assessment Research Centre. Look, thanks very much for that. Um, I'll stop there and see uh, if I can learn something from the audience and we can have a bit of a discussion. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Sandra, for the interesting talk. Uh, I was writing down some quotes that I think would fit really well on a t-shirt as well. <laughs> uh, like assessment is putting someone on a scale and uh, uh, normal distribution should not be normal. Well, I'll, I'll stop there, but it's very interesting and made me really think. Um, I'll start off with, uh, with a question. And um, I was saying before that you should post your questions in the chat, but I just realized that um, because of a different setting in, in our webinar account, we do not have the chat available today. So that means we would like to ask you uh, to raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and in that way, we can give you the microphone and you can still ask a question. Um, I was going to ask you, Sandra, um, you, you mentioned in the beginning some, some new aspects that the, that the first movers would like to assess. 
such as agency and connectedness. Um, and I was wondering, where do you see the field of learning analytics making its first impact? So which of these areas uh, do you think is, is reachable within the coming, say, 10 years for learning analytics to play a role? Which ones mm. are, the, or vice versa, which ones are very hard to measure or do you not see yeah. in the near future being measured? Um, I, I, uh, I think um, one of the things that's limiting learning analytics at the moment is that we're um, insisting, and you know, I do this as well, in working with the data that we find rather than the data that we can construct. Learning management systems and you know, thing, uh, platforms like MOOCs and things that generate the beautiful log stream data that is beloved by us all, um, they are very limited and constrained things. And therefore, um, we're shining the spotlight on something that is a small part of the whole of a student's learning. Um, I think the challenge for learning analytics is to get outside the log stream and start using other forms of um, data. For instance, we're um, putting a lot of effort into capturing judgments of people about the learning of a learner using digital tools to extend the area. So for instance, when we're, when we're testing some of the um, general capabilities of students, we'll go outside the LMS, outside the institution and ask employers of, of kids or students who are doing work experience so, um, and we'll, we'll get some tools to get th their judgments in. We'll work um, extensively with peers. We'll get them to do, uh, to video what they're doing out there. We'll get them to con construct portfolios. And that, those forms of artifacts, we try and abstract the data from them and then use, anal uh, we call it metrolytics, um, analytics with a measurement back with a measurement fundament to it. So we'll use metrolytics on data abstracted from those uh, broader activities. And I think that's the challenge. Um, at the moment, we're too focused on the easily um, captured digital data in our electronic learning management systems. And that is a very thin representation of um, our learners. So we need to get out and about a bit more with our data and think about it. Human judgment, capturing human judgment, in my view, is the thing that we want to focus on most. Right. So it's not just focusing on multi-model data, but multi-voice data moving even beyond the classroom. And yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. I like that multi-voice data. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a t-shirt with that on it. <laughs> okay. I see some raised hands. So let's give the floor to those people. Uh, Samuel, Samuel, sorry. Um, can I unmute? Uh, yeah. Unmute? Yes. Um. No, he's muted. Yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you from uh, the University at Buffalo, uh, where we're expecting snow tonight. So um, uh, I, I really appreciated your talk uh, in many different ways. Um, I'm trained as a learning scientist. And one of the things that we think about in the learning sciences often are theories of cognition. Right. And I couldn't help but think that maybe some of the challenges that you're talking about in terms of whether it's the customer or the government agencies. Right. It's that they're stuck in kind of a behaviorist learning model or you know, or variations of it, like an act are where knowledge is either procedural or declarative. And I'm just wondering, to what degree do you think, like, let's say, a theory of uh, cognition, like, well, certainly constructivism, but maybe even situativity. Right. Could be integrated into learning analytics. Um, uh, thanks for that question, Samuel. I think it's uh, vital that those um, fundamental uh, understandings that are coming from the learning sciences are built in. Um, so constructivism, uh, you, you take constructivism, for instance, we know that all learners don't, they all learn differently. 
they learn better when they're passionately when they're doing something that they're passionately interested in. We know they do better when the social construct, the social environment is uh, aligned with their cultural language and social aspirations and so forth. But everything we do in assessment, no, that's an overstatement. Many of the important elements of assessment, like standardised tests and so forth, strip all of that away. And what we actually need is to find indicators of learning on a scale that is supportive of different social contexts, different ways of learning, um, taking a constructivist view. So um, I, I think that the digital affordances that we've got now to capture um, as a, you know, multi-voiced um, data is great. And I think the measurement sciences can actually strip away the noise and get to the true, true signal in there. So Samuel, I think that you're, um, that is the challenge to get all of that understanding about learning and the learning sciences into it. The only uh, caution I'd have is as soon as I hear cognition, my warning bells go. Um, because I think we've got, we need to go well beyond cognition in, in understanding of learning. I think we've been dominated by cognition in the past. This is the point Lauren Resnick made about mentation. It has been all about the head. Um, my favourite uh, philosopher of education is Dreyfus. And he said, you can't get better proficiency or competence unless the head the heart, the spirit, the body, and the mind are all engaged, no matter what profession, no matter what discipline you're talking about. So I want to go beyond cognition into the Dreyfus territory in all our assessments. And um, I think it's absolutely possible. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have two other questions from Kathleen and Nathan. Kathleen, would you like to go first? Yes, it took me a minute there to get permission to unmute. But um, yeah, so Sandra, very nice. And I really liked uh, hearing uh, the perspectives. Uh, I enjoyed seeing the assessment innovation and learning analytics figure that you showed in the beginning. Um, and um, loved how you laid it out with the yellow and orange and blue blocks and talked about what's assessed and how it's assessed. Um, I was curious, you, you, sort of, you sort of said some of these areas were somewhat marketable and more of a priority for the center. And um, you, were, you guys were seeing the, some investments as possible in some of the areas and not other of the areas. I loved what you said about policing analytics uh, as opposed to learning analytics. But I did have a question. Um, some of the areas that you said were not, for instance, didn't have a market. Uh, would you say that would be the case if you were looking at them from a technology company perspective? In other words, if I look at these blocks in the diagram, I think I can point to some pretty valuable products around the world in all of these areas, but many of them are not, um, lines of, of, of funding that have come in through educational measurement, but are, are other parts of industry around the world in the technology sector. So would you mind speaking to that a little bit, to the degree to which you're seeing some of these as important players and marketable, but maybe not currently in the, in the portfolios of educational measurement or talk about that a little bit? Mm. Well, uh, hi, Kathy. Um, I probably should ask you to talk to that. I know your background and that you um, that you would have um, some terrific insights into that. It's nice to hear from you. Um, uh, look, I, I do. Um, what, what do I think? One of the things I think one of the positions I come from is that quite often that big business and the technology companies, um, they, they have very seductive and beautiful tools and so forth, but that often they don't go deep enough into the actual learning sciences, the pedagogy and the assessment 
that some of the first movers that we're working with actually demand. Like a lot of the technology companies now have, they'll say, here, take, take my critical thinking test and you will get a score for each learner on critical thinking, which is, you know, with a nice technology company's name attached to it, you can say to parents and to others, we've done a critical thinking test, but, and this is the score, but whether or not that score actually goes to the deep construct that we want um, to do with the qualitative shifts in performance is another matter. I'm sounding as though I'm, when I, as I say that, as though I'm against technology companies and, and big firms. I'm not really, but um, I would like to, I would like the research um, contribution, which is what I see we give, to go deeper and further and to point the way for those technology companies in the future so that we get a better product. I really worry that, um, I, I really worry about lack of validity in a lot of tools that we get, which will, will eventually start sending the wrong messages and will um, eventually get teachers to teach the wrong things and eventually get kids to learn the wrong things or students to learn the wrong things. So I guess I'm a purist at heart and I want, I want research always to be pointing in the best direction, not just the most marketable or the prettiest um, or whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, but I think that's something that's worth exploring in a bit more detail, Cathy. Yeah, yeah, Sandra, that's very helpful. Do, do you think then, would you conclude from that, that there's less of a mission for educational measurement in those areas or more of a mission because there is so much happening that they need to be informed by educational measurement? What do you think about that? Well, I, I know you know what I think. I, there's, more, uh, there's more need for measurement. And the, the deeper and the slicker and the more used these applications and so forth are the more there is need for measure just Kathy one one opportunity that I really see is getting some measurement modeling um, automatically built into some of these apps um, one of the things that we, with our first movers is that teachers are actually interested in how valid and reliable their own assessments are and so I think it's now possible and we're doing some work on this to build some um, some apps that enable teachers to do basically psychometric analysis of their work so that they can get some in insights into say person fit or um, item fit or reliability and so forth quite instantly in the past I don't think individual teachers or groups of teachers have had that sort of facility. So I see a, a, a bright new opportunity, set of opportunities for measurement modeling to improve education and assessment. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, um, I would like to give Nathan the opportunity to ask his question as well. If you can keep it brief, Nathan, that would be great. Hi, yeah, of course, I, I know we are uh, running out of time here, but I did want to, um, first of all, of course, thank you, um, Sandra, for, for the talk. I really appreciated your uh, perspective on uh, specifically, I think the standards reference profiling got me very excited about the possibility of this more nuanced uh, depiction of students um, being this sort of new paradigm. And so my question, which I'll keep this brief, uh, was basically, you know, I think you talked about the tail wagging the dog for a long time. And I, I do see schools and teachers being molded to sort of fit the assessments to which they are held to or to which their students are, are eventually going to have to take. And so I'm curious within this new paradigm that you're talking about and you see first movers moving towards, how do you see that impacting the systems of secondary education, primary education and teachers and their practices? Um, well, um, I, I can, uh... I can see how it's impacting um, and in, impacting teachers and schools and also universities and selection processes for um, um, the whole thing. 
as soon as you've got new learning intentions, there's a cascade. You therefore, if you've got new learning intentions, you therefore need new assessment techniques to measure those new learning intentions. You therefore need new kinds of standards. It's not enough to have an examiner just in, um, put inherent standards in an exam. So you need new kinds of standards. You then need new kinds of credentials. You then need new kinds of agreements between say universities and schools about how they'll use those new kinds of credentials. And then you need new kinds of metrics to tell whether the system is doing it properly. Um, but at the same token, if you've got new learning intentions, you really need new pedagogical approaches as well as new assessment approaches. So we're talking about a systemic shift um, uh, to do with these complex competencies. Um, how I'll, I'll um, make I'll send around a couple of reports that we've done, which illustrate the depth and range of changes by teachers, by um, assessors, by students in in the way they learn, and by tertiary institutions in how they select that spells out those changes. But um, that's why I call this a paradigm shift. I think we are shifting from the cognitive and the standardised to the complex and, um, and context uh, uh, responsive. And that this is a big paradigm shift, which means that um, it'll probably take 10 or 20 years to become the norm. But certainly our first movers are really showing the way and governments, I think, are slowly catching up and tech companies. Okay. I think that's a hopeful message to end on. That's although there's a lot of work to be done, that we're moving in the right direction. Um, so with that, I would like to end the webinar for today. Thank you very much, Sandra, for for being here and um, yeah, for delighting us with your talk. And uh, we will put the recording of the webinar on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, stay tuned for next webinar series. In two months, we will have the next one uh, featuring Hendrik Drexler. Uh, and uh, then every two months we have a new upcoming webinar. So if you'd like to stay informed, please subscribe to our newsletter via our, our solar website. Uh, and for now, I wish you all a good day or a good night and hope to see you soon. Thank you all. <laughs>